Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. All right, so super excited to be here today with you at Balboa. And I actually preached this message in 2014, or a version of this message in 2014. And, um, and the reason why I feel to re-preach it is because we're in our resurrection series. And if there's been one principle or revelation that has literally resurrected my life, it is this message. And the reason why I feel to bring it back after a decade is because it's still actually the message that people still are talking about. And the message that I send probably at least once or twice a week to individuals that are struggling with the same thing that I was struggling with before I got this revelation. I sat with a beautiful young lady um, over here at the end of the 830 service that said, this is crazy. I listened to that message this week. And then God just really confirmed with her. I mean, it's just, so God is moving and he is working. And I just know this message is for all of us today. Um, and Pastor John reminded me this morning as we were getting ready that it was also for me again. Yeah, I'm like, just go to Bayho. Just, just go, just go. Um, but yeah, no, so, so honestly, this isn't like a, a revelation you, 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 deal with once and it fixes your life. It's something that we always have to be aware of. So I'm actually really excited uh, to be preaching this because I know that this message will bring resurrection life to any area of your life if you apply the principles. And so I'm going to be preaching uh, today Mind Games 2.0. Mind Games 2.0. And you know, you may not be able to fully relate to my specific example or testimony or the things that I'm going to be sharing, how I got to the place of understanding this revelation. But I just want to encourage you, please don't go, oh, that's not how I am, and then disregard the principle of the message. The principle is a thing we all need to take with us and apply to our lives. And I also want to encourage you to, um, while you're listening, I know it's sometimes we sit there and go, oh, this person needs to listen to this message. And then you listen to the message through the filter of what that person needs to hear, which is, is I understand, send the message to them later. But today, if we could actually, I'll go, what do I need to hear from this message? And then you can send it to other people later. But think about yourself in this place. When I preached this message at Beho two weeks ago, I also want to encourage you, just for the sake of your relationships, to try to maybe inhibit how much you nudge the person sitting next to you. I saw a lot of elbow nudging happening at Beho a couple weeks ago. And so I'm just trying to spare you um, a little bit of tension and fighting um, in your relationships. And so <laughs> minimal elbow nudging. <gasps> All right. Um, so again, I originally prepared this for our relationship series, but again, this message will resurrect any area of your life. So we're going to get into it. And so about uh, the year 2013, Coming into the year 2013, 2014, um, I had, there was a pattern in my life that had been going on for several years that was extremely frustrating to me. I, when you looked at my life, I had an amazing husband. I had amazing kids. I had the house. I had the church. We actually were just ordained a couple years prior here and, and just overseeing this campus. And my life was actually awesome. When you looked at it, like it looked amazing. And I knew it was amazing, but I didn't feel amazing on the inside. Um, and, and this was where my frustration was because despite how awesome my life actually was and appeared, I didn't, I felt very dark, very depressed, very negative, angry, frustrated, bitter on the inside. I felt like I was depressed and I didn't know what to do. And I couldn't stand this because I didn't want to be fake. Like I didn't want, I wasn't trying to be like two-faced. I wasn't trying to like wear a mask when I came in, you know, to the house of God with this smile on my face. And so I, I just felt this frustration between my external world did not match up with my internal world. And I did not like it. I did not like feeling this way, but I did not know how to change what was going on on the inside of me. And so I remember in this season just feeling all of those things, like having an epic life and not understanding why don't I feel epic on the inside. And, and I just, I remembered that season and how difficult, I, he never said it, but I knew how difficult it was for my husband to come home from work. 
because he never came home and got a smile or a kiss or a hug. He came home to just constant complaints and me vocalizing my frustrations about how my kids misbehave that day or the state of the house or, or whatever, you know, it might be. But I just was thinking back when I was re-preparing this message going, gosh, John had to come home for years into that atmosphere and an environment. And I'm so grateful that he's just a faithful man. <laughs> but I, <laughs> yes. But I think we have to be really careful. Like, are we creating environments in our home where our spouse or our partner or our kids want to actually come into? Or is it a place they'd rather avoid? And, and I think we all need to ask ourselves that question, what we can do to create a beautiful atmosphere so people want to come home, home into, your, into your house and into your arms. So I didn't like how I was. I didn't like how I was behaving. I actually could probably honestly say I hated myself, you know, in that season because I, I did not know how to stop this cycle and I did not know how to change my behavior. And I would try to modify my behavior. I'd tell myself, just smile, be happy, do this, do that. And it would last for like a little while just using self-control, but eventually I would just slip back in to the same depressive, dark state. And, and it wasn't like a big secret in our house. Like John and I would talk about it all the time. I'll we were just like, what is wrong with me? Like, what is wrong with me? And, and we'd, we'd, we'd talk about it all the time, and he tried to give me counsel or advice. And, and, and one night, this is, you know, years into this cycle, we're sitting at another date night, and it usually ended up on the same topic. And, and at the end, I'm just like, babe, like, I, I don't know how to stop being this way. I don't like it. I'm not happy. I don't know how to change. I remember he just finally just looked at me and he always had advice or maybe something to share. And he just looked down and he shook his head and he's just like, babe, I think well, maybe we just need to cast out the spirit of be with an itch. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, yes, yes. Yeah, I think so. Like, I was not offended at the least because I knew I was one. And I'm like, oh my gosh, if it was just a demon, that'd be so amazing. I could just go have a powerful prayer encounter with someone up the front after a Sunday service and get set free and I'd be happy. But here's the thing, you're going to realize it wasn't a demon, it was me, and I'll get to that later. But <laughs> it, was, it was in that, that very night, I remember pulling up to our house and, and we lived on a Stella Drive. I remember sitting in the driveway. The kids were, my boys over here, so handsome, were four and five. I know they're probably turning red. Give everyone a wave. You guys are so cute. They're 15 and 16 now. But they were four and five, and my daughter had just was born. And I remember pulling up to the house, and I was sitting in the car. I'm like, John, you know I love you, right? I love our family. I love our kids. I love it all. I said, but I can't keep living this way. And I don't know how to change this or fix this. So I am going to go in the house and I'm going to pack my bags and I'm just going to go away. Hopefully it won't take me too long, but I, I just need to figure out what's wrong with me. Like I can't keep doing this like this. And I was just, I was very convinced. I was very in my right mind. I'm like, I think this is the solution. There wasn't a lot of motion. I'm like, I think this will help solve the problem. I just need to get away. I just need to go away for a while. And I remember him just looking at me. He's like, I think he said woman. He's like, woman, you're going to get in that house. You're not going anywhere, and you're going to go to bed. And I'm like, fine. And that's what I did. So at this point, again, I said this has been several years into this cycle. And can I tell you, on, in December of 2013, the revelation finally came of why I was the way I was and experiencing the kind of life I was experiencing up until this point, I had contemplated having vocal cord surgery for about five years. I had um, some significant challenges with both sides of my vocal cords that would cause me excruciating pain for about five years. And I put off the surgery because they told me, like, I could change your voice forever. You know, the worst case scenario, you couldn't speak. It was just all these things. And so I was like, oh, I can deal with it. I'll just deal with it. Um, and so, but the problem was, like, I would preach on a Sunday, and then I would not want to talk to anyone until about Thursday. It was that painful. I remember we stopped going out to restaurants for a few years um, with other people because I couldn't project my voice above other people, and I would leave feeling, like, excruciating pain. But I got to the point, point where I was like, I have to do something about this. Like, this is not getting better. It's getting worse. And so I prepared to have vocal cord surgery. And when you have vocal cord surgery, they told me you could not speak for seven days. That is a lot of days to not talk. 
as a female. <laughs> and and I was, I have three little kids. And so I'm like, if I'm not gonna be able to talk for a week, like I have to prepare to be silent. And so I recorded all these voice memos on my phone. I did all of them. It was Hudson and Holton. They were four and five, you know, so they would sometimes get along, sometimes not. So I recorded the memos. I was like, that's it. Hudson, in your room. Holton, against the wall in the kitchen. Time out for five minutes. And then like when they were fighting, I just hit the timeout memo. And then I would have like the brush your teeth, wash your hands, get ready for bed memos. And then I would have the I love you memos. And then I would have the, um, the prayers memos. And I mean, I had so many memos. I was so ready to be silent. And so, <laughs> and I remember it was, just, it was just such an interesting scene. So I go through the surgery, it all went well. And then like I'm, I'm in my week of silence. And I remember there was just like so many funny things that happen, you know, so I would be having to like, I'd have a whiteboard or I'd type on my phone and I'd hand like my question to, to John and then he would start to type back or write on my whiteboard. And I'm like, <laughs> like, you can talk. <laughs> I would go to the store, like I had to get something. I'd be like, where is the whatever? And they would again start writing their response or start doing sign language. I'm like, I don't, I don't know sign language. Like, I, it is, it, it's something happens to a person's psyche when you can't speak and you're in front of them. All of a sudden, something happens to their brain. And I mean, there was so much hilarity that was going on, like in this season. And so, but after a couple days into my silence, I realized that my household seemed very peaceful. I realized that John seemed to be more peaceful. My kids seemed to be more peaceful. And so what does that tell you about how I was personally affecting the atmosphere in my home with the words that were coming out of my mouth? But it was interesting because my household and my husband and my kids seemed more peaceful, but I was still not at peace. I had levels of torment. I still felt very negative, very dark, frustrated angry, all of these different kinds of emotions. And I just did not understand what was going on until. Because when you think about it, when you can't speak, you become very aware of your thoughts. So when I couldn't speak and anytime I had a thought, I had to decide, is this worth me like trying to do sign language to my kids? Is this worth me typing out or writing on my whiteboard to communicate it? When you cannot speak, you become very aware of your thoughts. And after a couple days, about two days into this, I realized and I became very shocked and very disturbed at the thoughts that were running through my mind. I had no idea how negative and dark the thoughts were in my mind until all I had was my thoughts. I had no time in this season to stop and think about what I was thinking about. How often do we stop to think about what we think about? We just think. We don't stop and think about what we're thinking about. And so I'll give you just a few examples. And remember, there is a scripture in the Bible that talks about not judging. <laughs> so I just thought it was the appropriate time in the message to remind ourselves of that. Um, but so, so my boys would be, you know, fighting or there'd be a difficult moment. And in my thoughts during this week, I'd be like, they're so annoying. I cannot stand them. Sorry, guys. I love you. Um, you know, I, you'd make, I'd make this dinner and then I'd put it in front of them and they would like complain or not want to eat. And in my head, remember, I can't say it. I'm like, I'm so sick of this. Those ungrateful little brats. I would be driving all over the place. I had my newborn baby and then the boys were in preschool and then in their little sports league. So I'm just driving just in the car all the time, loading the car, doing this for this week. And then I'm, I'm in my head, in my dialogue, this is all I ever do. Just drive around like a chauffeur. It's all I ever do. I never get to do anything for myself. And I'm thinking these things. John, you know, went golfing that week. I'm like, oh, must be nice. Get to do whatever you want to do. I'll just stay home and clean with the kids. Like, this is what is going on in my head. John was late from work one night that week. I'm like, oh, yeah. All right, great. I spent all day cooking dinner. Now it's cold. You don't even care about our family time. Like, these are the thoughts that were going on in my head. John would sit on, on the couch for like two seconds after I got off from work. I'm like, lazy. I'll just do everything. I mean, 
So these are the thoughts I didn't realize I was thinking. But then when you, when you stop to think about what you're thinking about, I realized how dark my thoughts were, and then I became very aware of the emotions that would follow my dark thoughts. I'd be super happy, I'd start cooking dinner, and something would happen with the kids, and then immediately I would think one of these things, and then I would just get all angry and frustrated. I get, all, you know, just, it just changed my entire mood, and then it changed how I acted towards my family. And so the reality was, my boys were good boys. The reality was, my husband was an incredible husband, but somewhere along the line, I had become unaware of the battle that was going on in my mind. That negativity, that criticism, that resentment, all of those things had gone uncontested. And so what does the Bible say? Proverbs 23, 7. It says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. As he thinks in his heart. So as he thinks, it starts here. Then in his heart, so is he. How you will be. My thoughts were miserable. And so I was miserable. It didn't matter what the circumstance, the situations were surrounding me. My thoughts were miserable, so I was in misery all of the time. And I think it can, we can point our fingers at other people or our circumstances and blame our misery on someone else or something or circumstance or a trial or a tribulation. But at the end of the day, we are the only ones responsible for the thoughts that we allow to go uncontested in our minds. You can't avoid the negative thoughts coming in. The frustration, the, the anger, you can't, you, thoughts are going to come, but you are responsible for the thoughts that you allow to take root in your mind. And when we allow these dark, negative, ungodly, wicked, demonic thoughts to enter our mind and we come into agreement with those lies, with those things that are dark in our mind, what's going to happen? As man thinks in his heart, so is the man. Those things you allow to take root will eventually become belief systems in your heart, and then you act and react out of how you believe. The Bible says out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you are speaking negative, dark, critical things, I already know what's in your heart. And how did it get in your heart? It started with a thought that you allowed to take root. So we can talk all day about the state of our heart, but if we don't guard our thoughts, there is no hope for the state of our hearts. Proverbs 4.23 says, you should guard your heart with all diligence because from out of the heart flows the issues of life. Another translation says, above all else, guard your heart for everything flows from it. So how do we guard our hearts? We guard our hearts by guarding our thoughts. It all starts in our minds. So I began my silent journey. This was, I had about five days left. And I couldn't communicate this revelation to, to John. That'd be a whole lot to type out. <laughs> like way too much for the thumbs. So I, I was like, you know what? I'm just, it's going to be me, God, the word, prayer, and my thoughts for five days. And I remember the scripture came to me. It was my theme during that week and has been honestly the theme of my life. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and any negative thought, casting down arguments and any high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Bringing every thought into captivity and to the obedience of Christ. And so this is what I did for the next five days. Three things, if you want to write these things down. The first thing, I began to capture every thought. What does that look like? When you capture someone, it's almost like you arrest them. So here's a thought, I'm going to capture it. You're not going anywhere. I'm going to arrest you, and now I'm going to question you. You capture, you arrest every thought, and then you question it. Is this good? Is this bad? Is this a God thought, or is this a demonic thought? Is this dark, or is this light? Is this good, or is this bad? Is it evil, or is it? So you, you, you capture it, and you don't let it go anywhere. You don't let it take root. You capture it, question it. And then once you discover 
that it's not a God thought, you have to do number two. You get to choose to accept it or reject it. It is so easy to come into agreement with that lie, that frustration, that critical spirit, that judgment, that, that negativity, whatever it may be. You get to choose if you're going to accept that into your mind that will then affect your heart and then the rest of your life. Or you can choose to reject it when you realize it's not from God. I don't want anything that's not from God in my mind. I don't want to accept one of the devil's lies into my mind. I want him nothing. The, the mind is the devil's playground. We do not let him play in the fenced areas of our mind. So we capture it. I realize it's not a God thought. I reject it. But guess what? We're humans, and we like to keep rehearsing it. And so no matter how hard we try, we want to reject that. Oh, I'm not going to accept that. They're not like mm -mm, all this. We, 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 we rehearse it. And so I realize I can't just reject it. I have to now replace it. You cannot leave that lingering. You have to replace that negative thought with the truth. And that's the third thing. You replace it with the thought of praise. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 8, it says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is anything excellent or if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And so now God gives us the tools. We need to think honorable things, just things, pure things, lovely things. He's telling us we got to think on these kinds of things. So when I'm trying to replace that negative thought, I have to do it with one of these. Let me give you an example. So again, so I'm frustrated with the kids. I'm angry. My mind wants to go to dark places. I want to complain. I want to be bitter. I want to be resentful. So when that, that thought came, this is what I did during that week. So that thought would come, and then I'd be like, that is not from God. I reject it in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that I have two amazing, healthy boys. God, I thank you. They were born so close to an age they could have a best friend. God, I thank you that they are healthy, that they are strong. God, I thank you that I get to be their mother. God, I thank you that you didn't just make them fun and smart. You all made them so handsome. And I'm like, by the time I start like praising and thanking God for my kids, like I want to go run and give them a kiss. Because my whole demeanor changed when I started thinking about how much I actually love them and am grateful for them. I had to replace the thought with the thought of praise, the negative thought with praise. Saying to my husband, okay, let's say he's, he came home late that night, that one night, so he would come home late. I'd have all this negativity. Oh, I'm just here all day, stuck at home, just cooking. He doesn't even care. He's just, you know, just doing his own thing and coming home late whenever he wants. You know, I, I could be having that. Or I go, no, I reject that in Jesus' name. I thank you, God, for a husband who works so hard. God, I thank you that he has a job. God, I thank you that he has, he is passionate to provide for our family. God, I thank you that he has such integrity and character to be the man that you've called him to be. And it's like, by the time he comes home, I'm not mad. I want to give him a hug because you literally have replaced the negative thoughts with all the thoughts that are true, lovely, praiseworthy, honorable, noble, all the things that the Bible says to think about. What do you think about your job? You have to go to work every day. Do you wake up dreading going to work every day? Oh, I've just got to go to my job, get a paycheck. Hate my job. It's not my dream job. Like, you get up dreading. Now you have a spirit of dread. You think you're going to have a good day? You, you complain about the work that, that's providing for you. And think, so, so you, you don't like your job? Okay, all right. Facts. But let's, let's, let's change our tune. God, I thank you that I have a job. God, I thank you that you are using this as a method to provide for me. God, I thank you that everything I put my hand to is going to prosper. God, I thank you that promotion is from the Lord. God, I thank you that you're going to give me opportunities to turn this dark atmosphere into a light atmosphere. God, I thank you for opportunities today to even share your love or encouragement or to pray for someone or invite someone to church. God, I thank you that I actually have this opportunity. Imagine what kind of smile is going to be on your face when you walk through those doors instead of dreading. No one wants to be around people like this. You would be like this. But it all starts up here in your mind. We got to get rid of that spirit of dread and replace it with the spirit of God in our lives. So the Bible says this. So this is what I did. I, every time I had a negative thought, because I was, I was paying attention to every thought I had, taking every thought captive, doing all of this, it was like every hour on the hour, like 
in the beginning during this week. And then all of a sudden it was like I, a couple hours would go by because I just kept like, I wasn't going to let those ungodly, wicked, negative, dark thoughts stick. And so what I found is the Bible says in James 4, 7, that you resist the devil and he will flee. He doesn't resist. He, he keeps coming at you. But if you keep resisting, eventually he's going to go because he realizes this is not a territory that you're going to give him any longer. You just boot him out of the playground of your mind. So by the end of the week, I cannot tell you, I had so much peace. I had so much joy. I was already sleeping better. I had affectionate feelings towards my husband instead of despising him. I had all these beautiful thoughts about my kids instead of being frustrated with them all the time. I mean, my whole demeanor changed. Everything in December of 2013, my whole life changed because of this revelation, this principle. And if God can do it for me, he can do it for you. And so after a week, um, I think women speak like 10,000 words a day. So I had so much stored up. And I remember sitting down, I was like, this is, uh, can you make after a week? And then all of a sudden you're like, let's sit on the couch. We're going to have a conversation. Like I get a talk. Like this is amazing. And so I sat there and I'm like, John, I know what's wrong with me. And this is what I said. There's been, there were so many things I could have said, but I chose these words. I was like, I hated you in my head. And he's like, I was like, yeah, no. So you would do this, then I would think this, and then I despise you, and then I get angry. I was like, I hated you in my head. And I explained my whole revelation and what I did for the last five days. He goes, babe, I do the same thing about you. Yeah. Yeah, we were both pastors at that point. You're welcome. <laughs> but here's the situation. So early on in our marriage, we actually knew what the Bible said in Proverbs 18, 21, that death and life are in the power of the tongue. The Bible says in James 3, 10, out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. So we understood the power of our words. There was life and death. We knew that we were never meant to curse what God has called us to bless. So early on, we learned that principle. So we would never curse each other out loud, but we never understood the power of cursing each other in our heads cursing each other or our situation or our family or our children or our finances or whatever it may be. We never really understood. So we had guarded our mouths. But we never learned to guard our minds. And those thoughts had gone uncontested and it was destroying every aspect of our lives. And so I remember watching this movie around this time and understanding this is powerful like, understanding this revelation will change your life if you apply this. It'll change every single area if, if, if you can capture the thoughts in your mind. And, and knowledge is power. And I remember watching this movie called A Beautiful Mind. And the movie was about a man named John Nash. It was a true story. He was a, a mathematician and a Nobel Prize winner. Incredibly intelligent man. But what we didn't realize and what he didn't realize is that in college he developed uh, paranoid schizophrenia with delusions. He didn't know that he had developed a mental health disorder. And so in college he began to meet this friend and this friend and get this job and have this boss and all these people he would be talking to the entire moving, working out, you know, uh, job situations and having conversations with this friend. And he did not realize that those people were not real. He thought they were very real. So he didn't know that he couldn't trust his thoughts. He didn't know his mind was sick. And in that movie, through the help of his wife and his colleagues, they realized that he had developed a mental health disorder. And the doctor said to his wife, the only way I can help him is to show him what is real or what is just in his mind. Your mind is where your problem is. 
And so many of us spend so much energy and time, like trying to change our internal or external circumstances, our job situation, our relationship status, or maybe we're going to move to another state, or we're just going to go on another shopping spree, and, and maybe we'll feel better, and it'll change our situations. But the problem is, the issue is that wherever you go, there you are. And more than likely, the issues and the situations are not so much out there, but the issues and the problems are actually within us. But we don't know that we're sick. We don't know that we cannot trust our minds because we've never stopped to think about what we're thinking about. And we've never stopped to think about that those thoughts that we think, how they become belief systems in our heart and then our actions and our behaviors and really the quality of our life or lack thereof, or we're going to eat the fruit of the thoughts that we've allowed to be sown into our minds. If we could dictate the thoughts that dominate our minds, we will experience a very different future. Because remember, the Bible says in Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. In Proverbs 4, 23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Your whole life is determined by the state of your heart. So if we can change our thoughts, we can change what we believe. And if we can change what we believe, we will then change our behaviors and our emotions. And if we can do that, we will change our futures. It all starts with the power of our thoughts. So what have we allowed to grow in our hearts because our thoughts have gone uncontested? When you think about all the different areas of your life, what areas are not thriving? Why don't we stop to think about what we think about that area of our life? What do we think about our spouse? What are the thoughts we think about towards our spouse? Are they dark and ugly like they were? Like mine towards my husband? What do we think about ourselves? Do we think that we can be successful? Do we think that we can prosper? Do we think that we can have the, the life and life abundantly that the Bible talks about? Do we actually think that God can work all things together for good for those who love him? Do we actually believe John 10:10, 10, 10, where he wants to give us life and life abundantly? Or in the book of Ephesians where he says that he wants to give us abundantly above all we could ever hope for or imagine. What do you think about your future? What do you think about your job situation? What do you think about your finances? What do you think about the possibility of owning a home in San Diego? What do you think about you? Have we allowed the devil to trash talk us? What do we believe about ourselves? When you go to start that job, when you go to start that business, what do you think about yourself? What do you think about yourself when you are trying to build up the courage to ask that girl out? What do you think about yourself? Do you think self-defeating thoughts? Do you think unworthy thoughts? Do we feel ashamed? Like, what do you think about yourself? Like, so many people have allowed the devil to trash talk them. They have, he has trash talked them and the thing that they are not worthy, that they're unlovable, that they should be ashamed, that they don't deserve these kinds of things in your life. None of that is in alignment with the word of God. Some of us need to start journaling and writing down all the thoughts that come into our mind about ourselves. Do you realize how precious you are? Do you realize how much God loves you? Do you realize the thoughts that he thinks towards you? The Bible says they're more numerous than the sand on the seashore. Do you believe that Jesus Christ has completely washed you clean? So when, Jesus, when God looks at you, he sees his son, Jesus Christ, pure, holy, white as snow. He doesn't see your sin. The Bible says he remembers your sin no more. But do you? Do you sit there and condemn yourself thinking you're unworthy, unforgivable? Those are lies from the pit of hell. What do you think about yourself? And I hope what you think about yourself aligns with what God says about you because that is what is true. And that is what's going to change your life. That's what's going to give you the courage to do all the things that God has destined for you to do. What do you think about? I want to encourage you. 
And I've had quite a few people take me up on this challenge. Because some of us, we just, we don't know why we feel hopeless. We don't know why we're actually physically sick. We don't know why we don't have the courage to go for that job or to start that relationship. We don't know why we don't have the courage or the confidence to start that business. Or we don't know why our marriage feels like it's just train wrecking. We don't know why there's dysfunction between our spouse or our relationship with our kids or even our friendships. Have we allowed jealous thoughts to consume our mind? Have we allowed comparison to consume our minds? What do we think? What do you think about the friend that got the job and the car and the vacation that you wanted? What do you think about that? I'm sure you have thoughts. Have they gone uncontested? Or have you allowed a root of bitterness to enter your heart that the Bible says will ruin your whole life? We have to think about what we think about. If we allow a root of bitterness, it will ruin your whole life, the Bible says. If you're resentful towards someone and harboring unforgiveness, you know the Bible says it's legal right and gives the devil legal permission to come in with tormenting devils. And you wonder why you don't have any joy or peace or sleep. Because you've given legal right for the, for the devil to come in and oppress your life and torment you. But it all starts up here. I have challenged people you may not have seven days. You might have a day. You might have three days. What if you chose to be silent and to be so conscious about the thoughts that come into your mind? I actually think it's really helpful to actually write them down. That's what I did. Because when you actually write it down, like the devil is like fully exposed with his lies. So exposed. You're like, oh my gosh. What, what if you took some time to be silent? Took some time to think about what you're thinking about. And you capture those thoughts. You arrest it. You question it. And then you reject them. And then you replace them with thought of, with praise, true, noble, lovely, one, all of those things. Your whole life would change. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he, so is his life. I want us to have the most epic lives. I want us to be prospering in every area like the Bible says he wants to. Like what area of your life is not prospering? Question your thoughts about that area. Let's get them aligned with the word of God. So you can live under the blessing of God, the fruit, like true favor of God. Our whole lives can change with just this principle. I want us to all have the abundant life the immeasurably more than you can all ever hope for or imagine kind of life. I want you to experience the fullness of God in every area of your life on this side of eternity. And it all starts with what you believe. I want people to look at your life and you don't even have to say the word Jesus, but they're like, I don't, I want what you have. What, how are you? What? How is, everything's in chaos. We have so much peace. Every marriage around me is falling apart, but yours seems to be flourishing. All, all my kids are dysfunctional, but you, you have kids that are in the house of God and serving the Lord. Like, let's live lives that everyone wants to know what the difference is. And it's going to be Jesus on the inside of us. God is so good. I'm telling you. <laughs> Romans 12, 2 says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We can be transformed by the renewing of our minds that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Be transformed. That's some serious, absolute kind of language by the renewing of our minds. Billy Graham said this, most of all, let the word of God fill you and renew your mind every day. When our minds are on Christ, Satan has little room to maneuver. When our minds are on Christ, Satan has little room to maneuver. Let's all stand to our feet. Come on, if you're in here and you know that you need to begin to think about what you're thinking about.
And you know if you, you apply this principle, there's going to be certain areas of your life that are going to change, that are going to improve, that are going to be transformed. If you want that transformation to take place, just lift your hands to heaven, and I'm just going to pray over you. God, I thank you right now for the transformational power of the word and the presence of God. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you are moving, that you are speaking, that you are in the transformation business. God, I thank you that you give us the principles to change every aspect of our lives. I thank you, Father God, for the word that's going to set the captives free. I declare right now that the the devil's plans and schemes for these people are bound in Jesus name. I silence the voice of the enemy. I silence his lies and I command you to be shut up over their lives in the mighty name of Jesus I pray. I declare that these people are leaning into the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. I thank you right now that only God thoughts, God dreams, God promises, the word of God, they are going to come into agreement with those things. I expose every lie of the enemy to keep these people bound in any single area of their lives. God, I thank you right now as they apply this principle to their lives, God, that they would experience transformation in every area. I thank you that relationships are going to be restored. God, I thank you that, that the lack mindset, the poverty mindset is going to be destroyed and they're going to live prosperous, fruitful lives. God, I thank you right now that the fearful thoughts are being smashed under the power of the Holy Spirit and they're going to be filled with faith as they align themselves to your word and your promises. God, I thank you right now that lives are going to be changed. Families are going to be changed. Destinies and futures are going to be changed. God, as we apply your word, which is true, which is living and which is active. God, I thank you so much for all that you're going to do in this place. Lord, I pray for every single person in here right now that does not know you as their Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray for those who have never began a relationship with Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for those who have never received the gift of salvation and forgiveness for their sins. Lord, I pray that you are stirring hearts today, that they would realize they may not have all the answers to their questions, but they know enough to know that they need Jesus, that they need to surrender their life to Jesus. So everyone, if you can put your hands down really quickly. Lord, I thank you right now for those that are gonna come into a relationship with you for the first time or maybe the second time today. If you are in this place, our eyes are still closed and you know you need a fresh start. You know you need to receive Jesus. You know that you need help to get your life back on track and you're tired of trying to do it on your own strength and your own power. Would you be willing to be introduced to your Savior today? The one that forgives you, that sets you free, that gives you a future and a hope and a plan that is far above anything you could ever hope for or imagine for yourself. If you are in here today and you need to invite Jesus into your life, to be forgiven for your sins, that you can spend eternity with him while no one else is looking around, can you just lift your hand up nice and high and I'm gonna include you in my prayer. Yes, I see you in the sweatshirt, the white sweatshirt and the girl up the back in the white. I see the white t-shirt here, yes. God, I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing, stirring hearts. Father, I thank you. I see you in the green right down here, in the second row. Gentlemen in the gray t-shirt, yes, thank you, Lord. I see you up the back in the green shirt with the purse on your shoulder and the dark hair, beautiful girl up the back, all the way in the back, so I see your hand in the, in the black. I see you. I see you right here, beautiful, with the vest on. I see you right here in the hat down here on the floor and in the black next to him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Yes, I see your hand right there, sir, right here to my left, your right. God, I thank you right now. Yes, gentlemen in the pink, Lord, I see you. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, who else are we waiting on? So many hands, so many hands, so many hands, so many hands. God, I thank you for what you're doing. God, I thank you that you are saving people right now. I thank you that you're forgiving people right now. God, I thank you for the future that you're going to give them. Lord, I just want to ask this question. There's so many of you. There's so many of you. And I want us all to pray this prayer together. And we're going to do this. And if you pray this prayer, you have received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. You can begin a relationship with him today. You're forgiven from your sins. You are washed clean today and forevermore. But I want to encourage you. We're going to pray this prayer. But after the service, if you really want to get connected with God, you want to receive a Bible, if you have a prayer request, we're going to have our ministers down the front. I would really want to encourage you. So don't let this be a decision where you moved emotionally. Come forward to experience the true transformation. Let them pray with you, give you a Bible, and maybe answer any questions that you have. But that's going to be up to you.
That's going to be your decision. But we're going to pray together right now. Everyone together is going to repeat this prayer after me, especially those of you who lifted your hands. So let's all pray this together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to save me, to forgive me, to wash me clean of every sin I have committed or will commit. Lord, I thank you for loving me, for giving me a future and a hope. Fill me today with the power of the Holy Spirit. Help me walk with you all the days of my life. I declare today that I am saved, that I am transformed, that I'm his child in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Wow. What an amazing word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen, for more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.